Magellan and the great Portuguese navigators followed in the wake of the monsoons and, at the end of the 15th century, crossed the Indian Ocean bound for Southeast Asia. Like them, we're approaching the coast of Thailand. Thailand is almost 1,700 kilometers long from north to south. The north and center are made up of mountainous areas and vast plains of farmland. Whereas southern Thailand is dominated by the sea, the narrow peninsula it shares with Malaysia is bordered to the east by the China Sea and to the west by the Indian Ocean. Before we arrive at Malacca, where our cruise will come to an end, we're going to set off to discover the islands of the Andaman Sea. Pakat, the pearl of the Indian Ocean, is now a mecca of international tourism. Known to sailors since the 16th century, Pakat, despite the pirates who infested the Andaman Sea, attracted Indian and Chinese merchants thanks to the quality of its amber and the beauty of its corals. But it was the booming market for tin in the 19th century that ensured Pakat's prosperity. Some of the thousands of Chinese coolies who came to work in the tin mines made their fortunes and built sumptuous houses in the Sino-Portuguese style. Open cast mining, urbanization and plantations, such as Hivia from which rubber is made and which was first grown on Puckett in 1903, changed the island's appearance. Only one 2,000 hectare nature reserve gives us some idea of the luxuriance of the tropical monsoon forests which used to cover Puckett. A sacred animal and symbol of Siam whose flag had graced until 1917, the elephant disappeared in Thailand at the start of the 20th century. There are now a mere 3,000 protected specimens in the northeast of the country. Today, elephants have been brought back to the island so as to maintain the myth, to provide some local color, and to take the tourists for rides. Nine hundred and twenty kilometers south of Bangkok, Puckett is a veritable tropical paradise in the Andaman Sea. Puckett became an international tourist center in the 70s thanks to its countless white sandy beaches, the best of which line the western coast. The island gradually opened up to high quality hotels and tourism, whilst retaining certain fundamental values of Thai society, such as its friendly hospitality, the use of teak in the construction of buildings, and the manufacture of furniture, and the passion for Not far from the breathtaking beaches and luxury hotels, Thailand's daily life carries on as usual. A hard-working, modest and at times cheerful life marked by an attachment to traditions, some of which go back to the dawn of time. The people who breed cocks are the state employees, elected representatives and shopkeepers. I used to be a teacher. One day I happened to go with some neighbors to a cockfight. After that, to start with, I bred birds just for the fun of it. But my first cock won a fight. I was so happy. Since then, I've made a business out of breeding cocks. At first, the cock didn't like me stroking him. I didn't know how to go about it. In fact, what you should do is stroke him without him seeing you. <laughs> In 
In popular imagery, the water buffalo is associated with Thailand's countryside. In actual fact, old habits die hard, and the buffalo is still used as a draft animal, despite the modernization of farming methods. Here we see an example of modern fish farming. First of all, you dig a pond, then you put in the young fish, and then you wait. About six months. They are fed twice a day, and then up to six times a day. Only at the end of this six-month period can you fish them. Next, you empty the pond, you let it dry for a month, and you start again. On board the boats entering the port of Pucket, the sailors are working away like a cloud of insects caught in the mesh of the huge black nets. On the quay side, there's the general commotion that marks the return of the boats. Almost 350 of the boats go deep sea fishing, an activity which is arduous but provides work for a great number of people. I used to sell fish here. Now I own four big boats and six small ones. With these ten boats, I employ about 40 people. When my husband died, I decided to carry on alone, just me and my employees for the sake of my two children. There's a lot of work. It's not very profitable. But I've done it all my life, so I stick with what I know. Once the fish has been unloaded, the agitation dies down and calm returns. Once again, the benevolent gods have escorted the boats back to the port. At the southernmost point of the island, other rituals are underway. Pagan worshippers of the sun god and believers with offerings for the elephant god are all here to watch the sea burning red and the day being consumed. continues in an atmosphere of refinement and mystery with traditional dances inspired by the Ramayana epic performed to the sound of the Kong Wong Yadzi a kind of rounded xylophone Patong, this little fishing port has been turned into a turbulent ghetto for tourists in search of fun, though not always innocent. Sex tourism is an undeniable fact. But it shouldn't mask Thailand's real face that we'll discover all along our journey. Starflyer left Pucket during the night and headed north for Surin Island. By morning, we're gliding over the Andaman Sea. The sails billowing in the wind, we approach Surin Island, just a few nautical miles from Burma's territorial waters. As we near the island, the captain takes over. 
have to go slowly into the bay because we have 2,500 tons. Our arrival is imminent. The sails need to be lowered, and this is rapidly accomplished with the help of some willing passengers. Although the passengers are preparing to disembark, the arrival doesn't mean that the crew can now rest. They need to tidy everything up and prepare the diving equipment. On a boat, every crew member has to complete his tasks very methodically. The Similin Archipelago, of which Surin Island is a part is a jewel which nestles in the turquoise waters of the Andaman Sea. It's now a nature reserve which is completely uninhabited except for a small Chowle community, the Sea Gypsies. We have no concrete evidence about the sea gypsies' origins. Do they come from India like all gypsies? We cannot be sure. They're probably the first inhabitants of this region, and it's thought that their name is derived from their itinerant lifestyle. Indeed, they use their boats as houses. Most have now settled on Puckett, although certain sea gypsy communities still live apart from the rest of the world in villages of houses on stilts, as here in Surin. Fishing, fruit picking, the growing of manioc, and the sale of seashells are the only means of income. Time is of no importance here. The women chat peacefully in an unlikely looking village square while the men go fishing and the children play. The Andaman Sea around Surin is almost wholly unexplored and it has the best spots for diving in Thailand. At a depth of less than 20 meters, the coral seascape reveals itself to us. It was patiently and selflessly built by an army of microscopic organisms, polyps. When they die, they pass on their skeletons to the next generation. This is how the coral reef is built and develops at such amazing speed, a meter 
every thousand years. In this undersea garden, we can see anglefish, surgeonfish, and soldierfish, in all some 240 species, whose majestic ballet is a continual joy to the eye. Back on the surface, we talk about our first impressions. Under the boat now. So, he's tall then, who cares? Okay, sorry. Oh, oh my the girlfriend is a boyfriend of mine. He goes, I said, he gets up. This is the. Then we head back to the Star Flyer, which is getting ready to sail. Thanks to the passengers' tireless efforts to hoist the sails, the Star Flyer slowly moves away from Surin Island. Go! And go! And go! In no time at all, the 2,500 square meters of wind-filled sails carry the four-master out to the open sea. So announced by Inner Japan. During the night, the Star Flyer has been sailing south, traveling a few dozen nautical miles from the Surin Archipelago to the Similan Archipelago. Both were classified as Thai National Marine Reserves a few years ago. Captain Lickfett explains that today has been set aside for relaxation and water sports. I would say if you like sailing with us, please welcome on the sun deck and you can help you don't have to help, but you can help to set the sails. If you only want to relax and make some nice photos, you can make some nice photos. But if you want to help, you can help us bracing, you can help us every time setting the sails. And also, you can lie in the bowsprit net and talk to the dolphins. The most relaxing, the most peaceful, the most comfortable. Four stays in here, yard. let go! So, if you are ready with the four cores, stand by four cores. Stop, Lenny! Halt, port side. Drifting port side, over. Drifting port side. Coming time. Coming time, Captain. 
The captain gathers the passengers together for the daily briefing session. On deck, he runs through the day's programs of events using diagrams on a blackboard to illustrate his words. Captain Lickfett may not have Michelangelo's talent, but he has a real gift for getting across to the passengers his passion for sailing. He delivers his speech with a touch of nonconformist humor. The word Similan means nine in Malay, which is exactly the number of islands in the archipelago. The Similan Islands were the result of hellish burning magma 65 million years ago, and they are now one of the last earthly paradises. This Garden of Eden is a rocky mass emerging from a turquoise sea. On a beach bordered by a lush tropical rainforest, the crew of the Star Flyer has organized a picnic, another way of making this day of our vacation unforgettable. I did some sailing, then I tried those two spots for snorkeling, on the left and the right, and I must say that of all the places we've been to on this trip around the world, it's by far the best snorkeling I've ever done. It's extraordinary. Of all the animal species that live all year round in the forest, the birds are the most numerous. The birds are protected by the National Parks Rangers, at least in theory. But the most surprising animal we came across in the forest was the Varamus, a lizard that can grow up to three meters long and which feeds on carrion, eggs, reptiles and fish. This one goes up, up, then it goes from the right, right under. Back on board and while waiting to get underway, a sailor tries to teach the passengers the art of knot tying. Not all his students are very gifted. Okay, smile. <laughs> <I> say, smile. <laughs> The crew raises the sails. Once again, the Star Flyer sets off, carried along by the wind over the Andaman Sea. During our second evening on board ship since we left Puckett, the atmosphere is very friendly. The passengers are already starting to feel at home.
The following morning, when we arrive on deck, the Star Flyer is advancing slowly amid an army of giant rocks whose outline is visible through the mist. Thong Na. We're sailing in the heart of Thong Na Bay, one of the most extraordinary natural sights in the world. According to legend, the farmers of the region are said to have attacked and killed by accident an elephant god, who then turned into a gigantic mountain. By the stone monsters or to pay tribute to them, the Star Flyer enters Fang Na Bay with all sails unfurled. Let it weighs anchor overcome by such a majestic sight. The real story of how Fang Na came about is far removed from the legend, but no less astonishing. At the dawn of time, the bay was just a plain dotted with limestone mountains. Over 10,000 years ago, when the glaciers melted, the water flooded the valley, digging out caverns and covering all but the highest craggy peaks. Puppy Island, Elephant Island, or Ogre's Head Island. The sides of the bay are made up of dense swamps, several kilometers wide, called mangrove swamps. The mangroves here, with their inextricable aerial roots, are the perfect refuge for crocodiles, though there are less and less of them these days. As we leave the mangrove swamps, the radiant Fang Na Bay appears once more, with its peaks emerging from the blue water. We reach Koh Phing Khan in a long-tailed canoe as used throughout Thailand from Phang Na to Bangkok. It's better known as James Bond Island as several scenes of the adventure movie The Man with the Golden Gun were filmed in this amazing setting. We spent the rest of our time at Fang Na Bay in the village of Koh Panyi, which is inhabited by Muslim fishermen originally from Malaysia. Koh Panyi is situated at the foot of a cliff which protects it from the monsoons and its houses are all built on stilts.
The maze of painted wooden houses and the interplay of light and shade are a joy to behold. A moment of tranquility for hurried travelers like us. Our last impressions are of children dressed in national colors playing barefoot in the schoolyard in Copagny. Pushed by a powerful motor, under a threatening sky which the sun's rays manage to penetrate here and there, our canoe brings us back to the Starflyer. Back on board ship, we all mull over our impressions of the day as the Starflyer heads calmly south, sailing past Fang Na's fantastic peaks one last time. Fourth day of the cruise. By now, used to seeing the sailors climbing up the masts, a female passenger plucks up her courage and begins to go up the main mast, secured by a safety harness. While we play at being sailors at the front of the boat, at the stern the sailors aren't playing. They're keeping in shape. Borrow the smaller boat and go over to Longkawi Island on the border of Malaysia. It's in fact the main island of an archipelago made up of around a hundred islets.
Langkawi's landscapes have been the subject of legends for centuries, with its heavenly beaches lined with coconut trees and its dense tropical forest. Macaques can be found in the lush forest to the northwest of the island. They live in groups of 15 to 30 and feed mainly on fruit, small vertebrates or insects when they're not being fed by people. This forest is where the natives prefer to go walking. Legend has it the forest conceals a waterfall where fairies would come and bathe. Legends are part of the island's cultural heritage. They're passed on by word of mouth from generation to generation. A long time ago, Mr. Bon Shapir was entrusted with Longkawi's most important legend, the curse of Makam Masuri. Legend has it that Masuri was a very beautiful woman. She was married to one of Langkawi's senior dignitaries. One day her husband went off to war, in the days when Siam was at war with the state of Kedah. During his absence, Masuri's in-laws jealously accused her of adultery, and she was assassinated in a field not far from here. When Siam's soldiers reached Langkawi, all they found were burnt rice fields, and nothing grew here for seven generations. That is a curse of Masuri. In the Taman Buaya crocodile farm, the saurians which lays in the water aren't legendary figures. They are very much alive. Our main farm is in Sandakan, which is in East Malaysia. This will be our second farm. And uh, so far, this is the largest in Malaysia. It's 40 acres. Now, uh, here, we breed our own crocodiles for commercial wise. That means uh, we breed the crocodiles for their leather, which uh, we do export to Russia and Japan. And apart from that, we uh, make our own skin products in uh, uh, what they call it wallets, ladies' purses, belts, keychains, whatever that comes. After the age of two or three, crocodile skins become too hard. They can at least have an easy life, unless they're hired to perform. Aggressive crocodile in the world. Weighing more than 1,000 pounds. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen. The name of this croc is a Bojang Lang. And for the finale, the star of the show, a 500 kilo crocodile lumbers in and makes a somewhat forced smile. Ladies and gentlemen, call it Magno.
Malaysia is famous for its forest, the oldest in the world, and its shores that great navigators and ordinary tradesmen alike sailed to for centuries. The land where the winds meet is what sailors have called it since ancient times. Chinese junks and Indian boats used to gather here, driven by monsoon winds. Langkawi's fishermen now just sail near the coast in their magnificent multicolored boats. Last time on the cruise, the passengers help with maneuvers. The sails billowing in the wind, the Star Flyer enters the Strait of Malacca. For sailors everywhere, the Strait of Malacca is a mythical place, filled with memories of the great navigators and pirates. As we pass between the Malay Peninsula and Sumatra and weigh anchor in Malacca, Captain Likfet cannot help being affected by this enchanted place and starts fervently sketching the outline of the caravel of Albuquerque, the Portuguese conqueror who first claimed a stake on Malacca in 1511. Originally occupied by a small colony of sea gypsies, the banks of the river Malacca soon became a strategic place for the shipping trade, as it's at a point where the monsoon winds meet. Be it silk and porcelain from China, nutmeg and sandalwood from the Indonesian archipelago, or carpets and jewels from the Middle East, the world's riches change hands in Malacca. The town has kept some of its inimitable charm from that cosmopolitan golden age. The rickshaw is certainly the best way to travel in Malacca. Let's first take a look at the Chinese quarter. The first Chinese community came to Malacca in the 16th century. With their famous business sense, the Chinese soon prospered and gained control of a large part of the town's trade. Nowadays, they're influential, above all, in the wood and rubber industries. In the narrow streets, you can see several houses which are masterfully decorated by the Babas, the nickname given to the men of the Peranakan community, the Chinese whose parents made their fortunes in tin and rubber in the 19th century. Some of these houses are now home to antique shops, which, through the variety and abundance of the objects on display, give a good idea of the town's history.
Founded in the early 15th century by the former governor of Singapore, Malacca was seized in 1511 by the Portuguese conqueror Albuquerque, who headed a powerful fleet. Albuquerque soon organized the town and built a fort which he called A Famosa, meaning the famous. The Portuguese left Malacca 350 years ago. But the ruins of A Famosa, in front of which these high school girls are being photographed, remain a strong historical symbol for the 500 members of the Portuguese Eurasian community of Malacca. My name is George Bosco Lazaro. I live in the Portuguese settlement. I have lived here since 1938. Here we speak Christian, that is Patois. It's not the same as the Portuguese, uh, Portuguese. not the same. In what difference? The difference, they have got the grammar. Here we don't have grammar. It's just like the Konkani in Goa. The origin of this blue card is from India. When the Portuguese people, they, before they attacked Malacca, their capital in Goa. So they brought this in 15th century to Malacca. So the Indian people, they want to carry their luggage, their goods are quite difficult. So that they are thinking, how to get the main transport to travel in the big empire of Malacca. So one of the workers thinking, they, why not we brought this blue card or the Marta Bande, or the Malay people's call Padati at that time. But the Portuguese people, they cannot pronounce uh, Martabandi or Padati. But they are using their language. Karaita Lambu is a Portuguese old word. Chinese, Portuguese, Indian. Malacca is a goddess with a hundred different faces whose history can be seen on every street corner and is a continual source of surprise to us. The Maritime Museum in the shape of a Portuguese caravel is a recent construction. By way of contrast, the Little Mill and above all, Christ Church, the oldest Protestant church in Malaysia, built in 1741, attest the presence of the Dutch for 150 years, followed by as many years of English occupation. The banks of the river are no longer as animated as they used to be. Only boats from Sumatra, the Indonesian island nearby, come to unload their cargoes of wood. The wood comes from Indonesia and I transport it on my boat to here, to Malacca in Malaysia. When I buy wood in the villages, it's already cut. Then we load it onto the boat. It takes around 20 days, and then we cross the Strait of Malacca to here in 12 or 14 hours. Once we get here, we sell the wood to a Chinese merchant, Mr. Ateng. The last excursion on our trip is to the old quarter of Malacca. A testament to a golden age that has now disappeared. A lesson of a wise old town that has seen it all. Although Islam is Malaysia's official religion, in Malacca, you find the country's three oldest temples side by side in the same street. The Chen Hun Teng Temple, or Temple of the Bright Clouds, built by the Chinese community in the 17th century. The Hindu temple to the god Vinayagar, which dates back to 1780.
the Kampung Kelling Mosque, built in 1748, and whose style is reminiscent of that of the pagodas. The Star Flyer leaves Malacca, carrying in its sails the fragrance of spices and the memory of sounds from another age, when Malacca was the richest port in the world.